kind of feel like I bring it all together here because a little background for you about me. I started my nursing career in the emergency room. I worked 15 years, almost actually 17 years in an emergency room in downtown uh, Baltimore and uh, then went on to become a nurse practitioner, spent time in the ER here at St. Joe's as a nurse practitioner for a brief period, and then went into internal medicine. So I uh, shared the internal medicine perspective. For, I went to uh, practiced that for five years, and then was recruited by Towson Orthopedics, the spine uh, group particularly, to work in the uh, spine practice as a non-surgical provider for particularly back and neck pain. A lot of our surgeons were being bogged down in uh, surgery and didn't feel like patients were getting in in a timely fashion, so they hired me to take on that role and see these patients quickly so patients didn't have to be out there worrying about it. Well, in doing that, I saw a lot of compression fractures, lumbar, thoracic compression fractures. And for the majority of these people, they're not surgical candidates. They're usually elderly, usually have a, a number of comorbidities. And so they don't need surgery lots of times, and lots of times they couldn't have it if they needed it because of those issues. And so we treated them conservatively, and I did that. And as a result, over the years of treating those compression fractures, I saw a pattern, and that was I was seeing patients back repeatedly for more compression fractures. And in the orthopedic world, and the orthopedic surgeons I worked with, they didn't want to take the role of take on the role of osteoporosis. That was a non-surgical role, something they didn't want to take on, but they wanted to recognize it and make sure the providers out there, the primary cares, the family practice, the internal medicine, whatever, were aware of the fact that we were treating patients with these compression fractures and we wanted to make them aware of the need to look into that osteoporosis component. And so we would send our letters off to the uh, PCPs, but unfortunately I would see patients back again with repeat fractures and I said, something's not right here. So about five years ago, uh, Dr. Ira Fetter and myself uh, decided we were going to take on the role of osteoporosis management because of the need to do that because it was, there was a lack of it out in the community. And the other thing was I felt in seeing patients uh, on a regular basis with compression fractures and talking to them about bone health, that there was a very low educational uh, level for the general public about what osteoporosis was. Patients would come in and say to me, well, I know I have osteoporosis. Dr. Delory takes care of my niece. He knows I have osteoporosis. What they were confusing is osteoporosis with osteoarthritis. So there was a big educational gap there. Um, and so we took this role on about five years ago, and we are here today working very hard to try to capture those patients that need bone health management. So I only have one slide, so I'm going to go quickly. Um, osteoporosis is a health threat to a lot of people. 52 million Americans uh, are, uh, have been diagnosed with either osteopenia, which is low bone mass, or osteoporosis. We know that it's a skeletal disorder characterized by compromised bone strength, predisposing uh, people to an increased risk of fracture. The diagram on the, uh, over on the right-hand side shows good healthy bone on the left with an osteoporotic bone on the right. You can obviously see that if you put a great deal, or even a small amount of force on that picture on the right side, you can easily collapse that bone very easily. And that's what happens with our elderly patients when those bones become fragile like that a simple fall, and this is, uh, Neil, you make a good point about people will deny how they fell or will make up stories or not, they'll trivialize their, their occurrence of trauma. Every patient I see for an osteoporosis evaluation post a fracture will say, well, I really felt hard. And I'll say, well, how hard did you fall? Well, I was standing up. Yeah, that's not a hard fall. If you, even if you fell hard from a standing position, that's still considered a fragility fracture or a fracture that should not have occurred if the bone was healthy. So there's a lot of education with, uh, for patients regarding the amount, I mean, the, the types of fall and when uh, we have to worry about fragility fractures. I always tell my patients this, if you fell from a ladder cleaning the leaves out of the gutter off the roof, I expect you to have a fracture. If you fall from the standing position when you tripped over the cat water bowl, I don't expect you to have a fracture if you have healthy bones. So that's how I explain it to the patients. They get a little bit perturbed. They go, oh, but it was really a hard fall. And I hit that, I hit that floor. It's a hard floor, I know. I clean it every day. Sorry. <laughs> All right, so in doing that, we have looked at many different ways to capture the population and try to educate our patients and educate the community, educate the team that we work with in healthcare uh, to capture these patients and make sure that if a fracture does occur, 
we need to prevent that second, third, and fourth, or whatever fracture. That's very important. But even beyond that, we want to try to prevent that first fracture from occurring. So we're doing a lot of things. We've developed the Bone Health Center and the Towson Orthopedic Practice, part of the University of Maryland St. Joseph uh, uh, repertoire. We've created a second fracture reduction program. And what that is, is every patient that comes to our orthopedic practice and we're moving towards every patient that gets admitted to St. Joseph or University of Maryland St. Joseph's with a fracture over the age of 50 will automatically be referred for an osteoporosis evaluation. Now we need to capture those patients in the ED that go home, the compression fractures that never get admitted, um, as well as the patients who get, get admitted and go through uh, having their hip surgery or whatever. So we're working to develop that program with uh, the uh, ED and the uh, inpatient arena. We have community education programs. I go out and I speak to communities regarding osteoporosis, trying to educate the general public. I'm happy to speak to any healthcare professional group. I spoke to the National Association of Orthopedic Nurses about uh, osteoporosis. I'm doing grand rounds for the nursing staff here in the hospital. I've met with the hospitalist uh, talking about our program so we can all have a coordinated effort to capture these patients because we need to prevent these fractures. One, from an ethical perspective, and two, because it's coming down the pike that we're going to get penalized financially in the healthcare environment if we treat a patient for a fracture and don't refer them for an osteoporotic uh, evaluation. The word out there is that if a patient comes through the ED and has a compression fracture and, we tr and they're treated for a compression fracture and sent home and nothing is uh, told to them or they're given no information about osteoporosis or a referral to the osteoporosis center, and say uh, 12 months later, they come into the same ED with a fractured hip. There's word on the street, and it's pretty, pretty going to be pretty validated. It's going to be validated pretty quickly that that fractured hip will not be paid for. So that's pretty painful, as our orthopedic surgeons will uh, va validate for, our hospital will validate for that. So we've got to be serious about making sure these patients are treated. Um, I do an osteoporosis screening with the hospital. They have a community service program, and once a month, we do an osteoporosis screening right in our office. So it brings the patient's focus towards the orthopedic world, osteoporosis management, and we do that screening for them. So the point I want to take, I want you to take home from here is that uh, the hospitalists, the palliative care, Dr. Schroeder, all of us work together as a team, you and the ED, you and the uh, outskirts with the EMS, we all work together to try to get these patients the best level of care we can give them. And we've got to try to prevent those fractures if we can, additional fractures once an initial fracture has occurred. So um, I will just leave it at that and let you know that we're very serious about it. What are the board. specifics of the fracture reduction program, just so I can oh, okay. patients? Yeah, good question. So patients that are seen in, uh, with a fracture are automatically dent. Anyone over the age of 50 with a fracture of the hip, the spine, the pelvis, the wrist, or the humerus are flagged and automatically called. Um, if not given a referral at the time of their, that they're seen by the provider who's treating their fracture, um, hopefully that happens. Sometimes it doesn't, but we have a, a, a second uh, uh, part there that if that's missed, then the orthopedia, I mean the osteoporosis center contacts. We have a list. We go through the, uh, we have a one, every week we print out a list of all the patients that have meet that criteria. And if we haven't gotten that referral, we call the patients ourselves and explain to them that their surgeon who's taking care of their fracture has wanted, wants them to have an osteoporosis evaluation. And then they're brought in and uh, we do a complete osteoporosis evaluation and begin the process of treatment along with education. So we're capturing all the patients that come through our current practice right now, and we're expanding that to the hospital and to the ED. Did you mention an age? Is there an age that you're targeting for the second? 50 and older. 50 and older. Yeah. Male and female, because it's important. We all kind of think osteoporosis, female, but we're seeing more and more males with osteoporosis, and we've got to address all of it. So capturing the 50-year-old uh, with those specific fractures, but honestly, I get referrals from the orthopedic surgeons for many other different fractures. For instance, if they, I had a lady that was referred to me for an osteoporosis evaluation by um, our foot and ankle specialist, Dr. Brody. Patient fell, uh, excuse me, didn't fall, was walking down her driveway and, and fell and broke her ankle. She had a trimalleolar fracture of the ankle. She said she didn't roll it. She was 64 years old. When he went in to repair it, an open reduction, he said her bone was so bad he could barely get 
good adhesion of the hardware to repair that, and he referred her right to me for an osteoporosis evaluation. And she was 64, but had a horrible bone density score. So she's on a medication to build new bone, which is what she needs. Um, so it can be other bones, but we really right now are targeting the more prevalent bones of fragility fractures. Yeah. Is there any reason we should put vitamin D levels in the ER? Um, well, I'm not sure that the, I mean, you, I don't know that so you, you will. eventually do it? Or oh, absolutely. Like you don't need to do it. All I want you to do is make sure they get that referral into that osteoporosis center. And then the other piece of that puzzle is that we know that when patients are discharged, you give them all that paperwork and you give them all the discharge instructions and probably not a lot of it actually gets absorbed by the patient and they take it home and some of it gets thrown away and some of it they read a week later and then they don't pay attention to that. So the, the bottom line is if we can create a structure where we know that that patient gets the referral from you all, but then there's a, uh, another way to go in the back door and get that information to us and say these are the patients that we treated in the ED this week over the age of 50 with these fractures that we referred for osteoporosis evaluation to your center, or we our center has appointment and, and emergency process evaluation to complete evaluation and talk to them at length about osteoporosis. I provide a lot of information to the patient, educating them about osteoporosis, the importance of calcium, vitamin D, exercise, balance, physical therapy when needed, gait training, safety issues in the home. So a lot of these in terms of, uh, I was very interested in your comment about assessing the home and the prevention uh, of what's going on in home in terms of uh, safety issues for them. And so if you can, uh, I give them all that. We do, as I said, blood work. We get DEXA scans if need be, and then we initiate treatment. The majority of patients out there don't understand about second fractures and preventing those in osteoporosis. So we've really got to work hard to educate the general public and get ourselves out there to let them understand how to prevent them. Is yeah. this a, a formal referral, or is this just, hey, if you're interested, call this number? I mean, because... Well, like, it's not a formal referral yet, but okay. that's what we're working with in terms of your staff, the orthopedic nursing staff. Whenever there's a discharge sheet that goes with the patient, whether it be from an outpatient area, meaning the ED, or from the inpatient area into a skilled nursing facility, we've got to create a uh, permanent structure that gets those patients into the... The two things I'm thinking, I mean, we can always incorporate it into discharge. If you're over the age of 50 and you've had a fracture, please feel free to call this number. But a second thing would be a nice handout that the nurses could grab or we could right. grab or somebody could give them and say, oh, by the way, right. here's a pamphlet. Um, right. You know, I've been here now over 10 years and now there's just little things that crop up that are just great about this place that I just didn't know they had. I mean, right. just a few months ago I learned about a, you know, a, a insulin, you know, a diabetes clinic that I didn't really know Absolutely. we had. And, and now we have something like this that we should have pre-printed pre-printed handouts in the emergency department. Absolutely. And they're gonna probably throw away discharge instructions. You're absolutely right. But they right. probably will not throw this away. I mean. I agree with you. I mean, and we can provide that. We can work on developing that. We're doing that with the inpatient arena and putting right. that part into their discharge uh, packet that they give patients. I can't emphasize enough, though, that we can give patients all they, all they want in terms of written material. It's gonna be really a better effort if we coordinate it with finding out who those patients are and also getting us to contact those patients and let them know how important it is that they've sustained this fracture and how not only taking care of their fracture is important, but preventing that next fracture and you need a full of that. Now the other thing is, is um, a lot of the patients will call and they'll say, oh, I'm already, already being treated for osteoporosis. Well, that's great, except for obviously it's not working. <laughs> because if you're being treated for osteoporosis and you sustained a fracture, something's not right. We've got to relook at that picture. A lot of patients will say, my primary care is taking care of that. Well, that's true. And we'll be happy to send a note to your primary care, but you need to see, or we need to get you in to make sure everything is working the way it should be and you're getting treated appropriate. So there is a very big gap in terms of the education of osteoporosis and people's understanding of it. How much improvement do you actually see once you identify osteoporosis? In terms of treat? How, how much improvement? When you improvement? start treating it, how much additional strength would maybe put in percentage? It depends on the treatment. There's a, a number of different modalities to treat osteoporosis. Some are what we call bisphosphonates that slow down the remodeling process and try to thicken the density of the bone. 
But patients who have a fragility fracture are beyond that, so most of them need a drug that's going to actually build new bone, lay new bone on that fragile bone, which is not what some of the other osteoporosis medications do. And so there's one agent on the market called teriparatide, which is a anabolic bone building agent that lays new bone down. And studies have shown that there's a 65% reduction in fractures on those type of medications that once the patients uh, get on those medications. And it's seen as early as three months into a two-year period of uh, treatment. So it, it is significant. And the bottom line is, if you do nothing, you're in trouble. You gotta do something. Would you agree there's a trend to move away, and I think a little bit from this possible, is you know, on our side of the house, we certainly see excuse me, more atrogenic fractures as a result of bisphosphonates. I mean, bisphosphonates are the colors. You know, bone's a live structure, always building, always breaking down, and bisphosphonates only seek to decouple that process. And for the things that we'll see is the bone quality that's left behind qualitatively, yes, it's more dense quantitatively, but qualitatively it may not be as good. So we'll see fractures elsewhere. We'll see low energy femoral shaft fractures in patients that have been long-term bisphosphonates. So I think there's a trend to develop new medications like the one we talked about. Right. Also very much looking at you know, anything that, 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 that adjusts uh, parathormone in the body and trying to, trying to get after bone quality and bone density that way. But it's, it's much better every day, and especially if I'll say if they refer to the males that have these fractures, that's, it's, it's exploding how many males are right. being diagnosed. Because we often, we're males, we're big bone, we don't need right. this. We don't get osteoporotic, and it could be further from the truth. Right. And we're just heavier, and we're going to fall that much harder, and we're going to break that much more. So. And we're living longer. We have an older yeah. population. Bones age just like the rest of you know, the, the body does, and so they get fragile. They get older. They're not as healthy. And yes, we probably are seeing a, a trend away from the bisphosphonates, which are the Fosamax, the Boniva, the Actinels, those sorts of things. But really, from this perspective, from this arena, you're to, we're talking about fractures. They're not even appropriate medications to consider. So if a patient's on Fosamax or Boniva, and they come through the ED and they're admitted through the, uh, to the hospital and they're on a Fosamax or Boniva or one of the bisphosphonates, they're reclassed, you know, you can just say, well, sorry, no more. We've got to go to the next step. And so there's, there's other things we need to do. Great, thanks.